Okay, so this lecture is about research design and in this lecture specifically we're going to concentrate upon one of the key methodologies that's available to the positivist. As, uh, specifically, I'm going to be talking about the experimental research method and I'll explain different experimental research designs in this lecture. So the experimental method is the key method for the positivist and it seems to be the method that uh, is held in the highest of regards. Um, the classical experimental method, if we uh, uh, think about it, is basically based upon this idea of randomization. Um, you have two groups of individuals uh, that you will select. One group will be your control group and the other would be your experimental group. So the idea is that you populate both of these groups, the experimental and the um, control groups, randomly. So that's the idea behind a classical experiment where you assign individuals to both these groups in a randomized manner. Now, how do you go about ensuring randomization as a different concern? It could be as simple as drawing lots from um, a, uh, a container of some sort, or it could be based upon flipping a coin or throwing uh, dice and then selecting individuals to go into either the experimental or the control group, right? Now, what happens in the control group is that there is no intervention uh, introduced by the researcher. So whatever is remains as is. That is, uh, no change is introduced in the control group. Whereas in the experimental group, some sort of a stimulus is introduced or some sort of an intervention is introduced. And then we're trying to see what would be the effect of that intervention on that particular group. And we can get to know more about the effect by comparing the experimental group with the control group, right? So the control group doesn't receive any stimulus or intervention, whereas the experimental group is going to receive some sort of an intervention. Now, in management sciences, many studies have used the experimental method. Uh, for example, you've got the Mayo and Roethlisberger study at the uh, General Electric's Hawthorne Power Plant, uh, and that was conducted between 1927 and 1932. And if you recall from your readings and management, um, this particular experiment dealt with two groups of individuals. One was the ladies and the other was the gents. The ladies were working in something called the assembly line. So different types of interventions were introduced, such as longer breaks, shorter breaks, intensity of lights, etc. Whereas the gents were working in the um, uh, assembly, uh, sorry, the, the wiring bank room in which they were assembling different bunches of wires and uh, different types of financial incentives were placed in front of those individuals to try to see how they behave. Right? So we learned a lot from this particular Hawthorne experiment, uh, but some significant findings did emerge from this particular study, specifically because the study went wrong. So that was quite interesting because um, the expected results were not reciprocated by the participants, rather we got certain unexpected results. So which required further more experiments to be designed and further more data to be collected in order to make sense of what was going on. But it was not a bad study uh, because it was a very systematically designed study. And the idea is, according to Austin, that the more systematic your research design is, the easier it is to achieve scientific breakthroughs, right? So scientific breakthroughs would be more probable if we have a systematic uh, research design, meaning that it could be uh, replicated or it could be redone, right? So this is something that was going on for the Hawthorne Power Plant study. The third thing that the Hawthorne Power Plant study has contributed is that it has raised awareness of the idea that the researcher has a particular effect upon the people being researched. 
Um, that is that uh, the presence of the researcher can distort uh, the actions of the individuals being researched, right? So put simply, uh, the mere fact that you're being observed is going to alter your behavior. Right, so this is a very famous experimental study called the Hawthorne Power Plant Study. Uh, there's a, also another famous study by the name of the Milgram Study in which, uh, if you remember, I talked about it in the class before, where we were, uh, where they, they decided to uh, punish individuals and, uh, you know, the, the people um, that were placed into the experiment uh, were given the stimuli that go ahead and punish the individuals because they have done something bad and they had to turn a particular dial. Uh, so that study had a particularly different effect upon the people uh, involved in the experiment in the sense that it altered them. It altered their psychology and it played with their uh, mentality and it, it created further new problems for us. So we'll discuss those um, uh, shortly. Right? So there's different advantages that are there of the experimental design. Uh, and these advantages are present and there are certain disadvantages as well. The advantages are that the experimental designs, they, they uh, basically encourage and they clarify about what uh, is being investigated. Um, and they eliminate many alternative explanations uh, and they can do this purely because of this idea of randomization being present, right? So the experimental and control groups, as I suggested before, are being populated randomly. So in that way, we're, we're sort of uh, limiting the different possibilities altogether. And the alternative explanations are being reduced significantly. So that's one advantage uh, in which we can possibly get to the cause and effect uh, chain very clearly and we can see what causes what, right? Um, the second advantage of an experimental design is that it's a highly systematic research design. So therefore, an experimental study could be replicated. And we've got certain examples of this uh, being available to us. For example, Newton's experiments have been replicated across the world and we all uh, tend to get the same results out of it, right? So the, the reason being is that they were highly systematic. Now, the disadvantages are that uh, there are disadvantages which are uh, somewhat related to practicality, and there are certain disadvantages that are related to the concern of ethics, right? So for example, the experiment uh, could end up harming the participants. And the example of this being is the Milgram study in which the uh, participants were administering electrical shocks, even though they were fake electrical shocks given to actors who are behaving in a particular uh, manner, but that affected the individuals who participated in the experiment because they were uh, mentally uh, damaged and they had psychological issues arising in them because of the nature of this exercise. Right? Uh, subjecting participants to experimental stimuli may not necessarily be ethically acceptable. Now, in the natural sciences, you can um, apply any kind of stimuli to any kind of material, and that ethical concern is going to be pretty much absent. But in the social sciences, you're dealing with human beings, and if you're applying uh, some sort of a stimuli which could physically damage that person or mentally damage that person, so then we have ethical concerns. Now, right? The practical concern is that it may not be possible to conduct an experimental study in a particular environment or the, the nature of uh, the question that we may have would be such that it would not be possible for us to uh, go about conducting an experiment uh, regarding that phenomenon, right? So that could be the practical concern. Um, to overcome the issues of um, the practicality and ethics, ethicality, um, one way has been uh, the, the random design uh, uh, type of experiments. And another way is to then go away from that random design into what are known as the quasi-experimental designs, 
And these have been specifically invented to overcome the issues of practicality and ethicality. And uh, to an extent that in certain conditions, um, a randomized design would not give you uh, the right findings, rather a quasi-experimental design would give you better findings, right? And quasi means um, almost like an experiment, right? So it's not really an experimental design, but it's almost like an experimental design. Now, quasi-experimental designs, um, what happens in these is that we use multiple measures over time in order to reduce the effect of the control and experimental groups um, where these groups are not fully matched with each other. Right? So what this means is that we're going to be populating the experimental and the control groups with individuals that would be almost alike, right? There would be uh, indistinguishable uh, differences that would exist amongst these. So in the quasi-experimental, what would happen is that we're not going to randomly populate these two groups, rather we're going to populate them based upon certain criteria that we would have established as researchers. Um, and by doing this, we are actually uh, reducing this ethical and practical concerns that exist for us. Uh, validity of such studies is going to depend critically on how equivalent the two groups are. So the more equivalent the two control and experimental groups are with each other, the more valid our findings are going to be. Uh, the less matching that exists between the two, uh, the more invalid our findings would be uh, considered to be. Right? Um, but there is no guarantee as such that both the groups are going to be pretty much similar to each other, even though you've got very well-defined criteria available to you, there will be some sort of innate differences between the individuals in these groups. Uh, that could be their historical uh, backgrounds in the sense of their upbringing, in the sense of their education and their economic status and so on and so forth. It could also be because of the pretest idea that we may have in which we are testing the individuals before uh, the injection of the intervention, which causes a bit of a bias to be coming into uh, the respondents and their uh, answers to questions may uh, change uh, a little bit. So in such um, uh, issues are going to be present, the validity concern is going to be there. So as a quasi-experimental uh, design, if, if you're doing one, you have to be uh, caring about ensuring the validity of your uh, findings. Um, some purists insist that such designs should be called as non-experimental designs rather than quasi-experimental designs. Um, but in practice, what uh, research has found is that non-experimental designs or the quasi-experimental designs um, do lead to stronger inferences in certain settings where a true experiment or a randomized experiment will uh, not give you the same type of results. So the quasi-experiments have been tried and tested and they seem to uh, work and uh, they give back some uh, really valid findings to us. Now, the commonality uh, that exists between the experimental and non-experimental designs is that both these designs offer uh, clarity. Uh, they help us to clarify certain concerns. Uh, they offer transparency and they offer uh, repeatability. They, that is that they are systematic and they can be redone by either you or somebody else in the future. However, uh, because we're not dealing with physical phenomena, rather we're dealing with human uh, beings and uh, social phenomena, therefore the concept of the pretest uh, and the post-test is going to have certain effect upon our uh, respondents, and that is known as the measurement effect, right? For example, the pretest may engage the participant to think about a certain issue, uh, which uh, leads them uh, to become aware of that issue before the intervention is introduced, uh, so that could cause certain um, skewness in the results that we get, and that type of a um, 
error that we get is called a measurement effect or a testing right? now there are four types of uh, designs in the quasi experimental category one we have is the cross sectional comparison design then we have the pre test post test design uh, we've got the randomized control group design and we have the fourth one which is called the non equivalent control group design so i'll shortly um, give you a brief introduction to these four designs right so the first design that we have is called the cross sectional comparison design and this is a experimental design that is often used in management research or in business research however it is considered to be a weak design what this design involves is that we select a group of people who have experienced something for example they have experienced a degree program they have experienced a training of some sort they have experienced uh, some sort of change in technology whatever have you and the researcher in uh, such uh, cross sectional uh, comparison designs is interested in uh, what that experience has uh, done to these participants how it has affected these participants and what you're trying to see is that you know further interventions when introduced into that group uh, is that intervention going to affect those individuals similarly or differently right so no firm conclusions come out of this as far as the cause and effect are concerned it is impossible to come up with firm conclusions um, regarding the cause and effect because it is difficult uh, that the group varies only on one factor such as that your experimental group is receiving uh, or has experienced something whereas your control group uh, has not experienced that uh, because you are dealing with human beings their experiences their past history uh, etc is going to be different so it would be highly unlikely that your control and experimental group are going to vary amongst each other on only a single factor but if that was somehow possible which it is impossible uh, therefore you, you're not going to see a lot of advancement of knowledge and a convincing way uh, however this is a easy way of going about doing an experimental design uh, and that's why we find this to be prevalently used in uh, business settings right um, how this uh, experimental design looks like is that you have got a group one which we can consider to be our experimental group and group two which we'll consider to be our control group uh, no pre-test is done in either of these uh, two cases uh, because we don't want to bias the individuals uh, then we have uh, some sort of an intervention in the sense of uh, the uh, experimental group and then we have a post test in which we see how that intervention affected that experimental group and in group two, we've got no pretest, no intervention, and then we post test to see whether we have that those group members have changed in any particular way. The second experimental design is called the pretest post test design, and uh, it works on the common principle, which is that when something changes, you must measure uh, before the change and uh, after the change, right? Let me fix this. You have to measure uh, before and after the change. So, this is the pre test post test design. Uh, this type of a design is also called a longitudinal design because you are collecting data not once but three times in the sense of the pre test is the first data collection, during the intervention is the second data collection, and uh, during the post test is the third data collection so you are not approaching your respondents once rather you're approaching them multiple times over an extended period of uh, time so that's why it is also known as a longitudinal design the utility of the pretest and the post test is to examine or to ascertain whether the same change would be observed if the intervention had never taken place right so we're trying to gauge um, 
how that intervention is affecting upon the individuals. Uh, and we're trying to ascertain whether that intervention is having some sort of an effect or not. Right? Um, change could be pre-experiment, for example, some sort of a historical event, or it could be maturation, which would happen during the research design. Right? So historical effect, I think you would understand it by now, that somebody has received a degree or they have already gone through a particular type of a training, whatever have you. So that would be an uh, historical. Maturation is something that happens during the research process in which the respondents are learning and they're becoming wiser and they're uh, you know, maturing in their thought patterns and their understandings and so forth. So that happens during their experimental study. So the pretest matures them, um, the intervention and the data collection that happens in the intervention period, the first time it matures them. So maturation is something that is going to happen uh, through this process. Right? So subtle changes over time uh, that we'll be uh, seeing through this uh, design of uh, an experiment are going to be called as the testing effect. And these uh, are leading from the respondents reflecting on their answers, which they provide to us for the first time. So surely the second time that we ask them the question, their answers may not match the first answers that they had given to us. So there's going to be a little bit of a difficulty in um, the process of measurement. Um, uh, and uh, that's going to be uh, difficult to ascertain, right? Uh, the effect of the maturation and also of our uh, historical or our past experience being there, right? Um, how this experimental design looks like is that we normally would have just maybe one group. We could also do a two group in the sense of the control and the experimental. But we'll have a pretest, we will have an intervention, and we'll have a uh, post test as well. Uh, the third type of experimental design that we have is called the randomized control group design. And this design deals with the maturation and internal validity concerns that existed in the pretest post test design by using control groups of individuals who are the same as the treatment group in every way except that they do not receive the intervention. So, this is now coming closer to the idea of a pure experiment or a randomized experiment. Right. And how do we uh, make, make sure that both the groups are populated by the same individuals is through the idea of randomization, which could be as simple as flipping a coin, throwing a dice, or using a random number table. Uh, the history effects and maturation effects uh, will show in changes in the control group, and the effect of the intervention can be seen by comparing those changes in the experimental group against the control. So this experimental design looks like this. You have a pretest, you have an intervention, and you've got a post-test, and group uh, two is going to be your control group, so in which case you can have a pretest, no intervention, and then you could have a post-test as well. Um, and the last uh, experimental, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in, in this randomized control group design, um, we deal with maturation and internal validity by using control groups of individuals who are the same as the treatment group in every way, except that they do not receive the intervention, right? Uh, and we can do this by flipping the coin, and I, I showed you the wrong answer, uh, the wrong uh, design here. Uh, I clicked on the wrong slide. Um, this is how the randomized control group design looks like. You have a randomized group one and you have a randomized group two. Both cases there is a pretest and in both cases there is a post test. In the control group there is no intervention and in the experimental group you have an intervention. Right. So this is the randomized control group design. The last uh, experimental design is the non-equivalent control group design. And this is considered to be a weaker form of a research design, which captures the strength of the randomized control group design. Uh, and this uh, design looks almost like the randomized design. However, we don't use randomization when we're allocating individuals to the control. 
individuals and the experimental group. Rather, we assign individuals to these two groups based upon certain criteria, maybe experience or age or something, uh, you know, relevant uh, that uh, the research considers would be a good way of populating these two groups. Um, this design is considered as a non-experimental research design and it assumes that nothing happens in real organizations during the intervention in the sense that the idea behind the non-equivalent control group design is that the intervention is not really going to uh, have much of a uh, effect upon the people um, in the sense that they're not going to change, uh, no maturation will happen and no historical effect will be present. Right? So this uh, research design looks like this. You've got the experimental group and you've got the control group, pre-test in both cases, post-test in both cases, intervention is present in the experimental group, no intervention in the control uh, group, uh, and the idea is that randomization has not taken place. Um, and the last concern that we have is the idea of validity. Um, so this is a concern that pops up in research studies again and again, uh, and this is a concern that also applies to this experimental designs, whether you've got a random experimental design or a uh, quasi-experimental design or a non-experimental design, the validity concern is going to be present there. Um, validity, uh, specifically, when we talked about uh, talk about it, uh, there's two types of validity that exist. One is called the internal validity, and the other is called the um, external validity. Um, validity is increased uh, via randomization. So we will have more valid answers coming to us if we have a randomization in our experimental design and our answers would be considered less valid uh, the further away that we get from a randomized experimental design. And experiment, uh, external validity has to do with uh, the idea of generalizability um, of the results beyond the focal study. So the more your uh, study is generalizable, the more the external validity and the less the study is generalizable, the less would be uh, the external validity. So I'll stop uh, here and in the next lecture I'll talk about then the uh, survey uh, methodology. Thank you very much.